L'chaim, L'chaim. The first L'chaim is the Rinishmas. The Rebbe's general, if it's on David Groner, that was all Shemaima just a little while ago. So L'chaim. So L'chaim. So L'chaim. So L'chaim. So L'chaim. In the stories of Jewish folklore, there is a well-known story about a certain rabbi that this rabbi would give a shear twice a week. Every Tuesday evening and every Shabbos afternoon. He wasn't in a very big congregation, but he always had one loyal attendee, and that was his wife. No matter what the weather was outside, no matter how many people were interested in what he was talking about, his wife would come every single drasha to make sure to support her husband in his work. This was going on for 20 years. In the meantime, the rabbi noticed something very interesting. That every single time after he spoke and they would come home, his wife would go into the room, lock the door for a second, and after a little while open up the door. And he was very surprised, he didn't know what was behind this peculiar mimic to lock the door every time after he spoke. Finally he decided he's going to find out, and sure enough, he follows her into the room, he gets into the room, and he sees that she's holding a box in her hand. So, he opens up the box, and he's wondering what is in this box that can be so important. In the box, there's four eggs and $200 bills. So, this is like even stranger than the minig. So he turns to his wife and he says, My dear wife, maybe you can explain to me the reason behind this minic. So she says like this, you know my dear husband, I've been coming to every one of your shiurim for years. I decided after a while that I'm going to rate your shear. Every time it's a good shear, I have nachas. When I think the shear is a little bit off, I put one egg in a box. Okay. So he looks into the box, and he's all excited, he's all proud, only four eggs in 20 years. So now this is something that he feels good about. So, he turns to his wife, and his ego just like soared, because his wife thinks the world of him. And he says, no problem, you can continue doing what you're doing. As he's about to leave the room, he turns around and he says, My dear wife, what's with the 200 singles? So she said, my dear husband, I was hoping you wouldn't ask. But now that you asked, I have to tell you the truth. Every time there are a dozen eggs in the basket, I sell it for a dollar. Amo, we come and we hear drosha after drosha, time after time. This one's explaining this and this one's explaining that. And we go home and we're not sure exactly what we heard. And we don't even know how to rate this. Tonight, Gimel Tamos, we have to speak a little more practical. That there shouldn't be an egg in the box when we come home. I heard a fascinating story. What's fascinating about it is that it actually happened. You know, most exciting stories never happen. But this exciting story is a story of a person's life, and this story really happened. It's about the life of the renowned Hasidic author, Rabbi Tzvi Freeman, who's the author of the book, Bringing Heaven Down to Earth, and he lived for many years in Vancouver, Canada, and recently he moved to Toronto, Canada. A couple of years ago, I was sent on Slichis, like all Bachem in Yeshiva, for two years in the Yeshiva in Toronto. So of course, while I was there, Mamzer Bakat Metachsidish Yidin. 
The Rebbe said on the city of Toronto, Darton Vagelin, the Chassidus Shehidin. So therefore, we try to make an effort to find them. So one of the true gems in the city is Rabbi Tzvi Freeman. So one time I was talking to him, and I asked him, Tzvi, you're an intellectual person. Why did you become Frum? You know, it's not like you were looking for some spirit and L'chaim and Chabad gave you some drinks or something. You're a man that's very smart, a man that understands. Why did you become Frum? So he tells me, Gershin, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. He said, in the late 60s, early 70s, I was with a group of friends in Vancouver. And at that point, being in a cult was very in. Everyone was part of a certain cult. That was the in thing to be part of a cult. And I told my friends that I will never join a cult. Fine. One day, I open up the local Jewish newspaper, and I see an advertisement that two Bochrim, Merkis Luchim Bochrim, are coming to Vancouver. One of them was Rabbi Yossi Hecht from Milat, and I forget who the other one was. And it says that in Shul on Shabbos, between Mincha and Mayriv, they're going to say over a Hasidic discourse. Now these Bochum were straight out of 770. Anyone knows how Bochum from 770, Chaz is a Well, the Rebbe asked, and the Rebbe brings it up, and the Rebbe slugs it up, and the Rebbe brings another, and the Rebbe brings another, and the Rebbe slugs it up. So the kid, so he comes to the Mimer, doesn't understand a word. All he sees is that there's one guy out there that's totally convinced about what he's saying. What he's saying, he has no clue, but there's somebody out there that's convinced about what he's talking about. So he goes over to Rabbi Hecht, who was then a Bochur, and he tells him, young man, maybe you can tell me what you said, a little bit in English this time. So he said, I thought I was speaking English before. He says, no, 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 English that I understand. Fine. He tells him, I just delivered in 25 minutes the secret to the purpose of creation. Now this totally blew him away. Secret of creation, this is like heavy stuff, especially those days. That was the biggest line, purpose and reason and feeling and all this holy stuff. This is what he wanted to hear. So he says, which guru do you know that teaches you the purpose of creation? So he says, there's a place in New York, it's 770 Eastern Parkway, and there's a rabbi, his name is Rabbi Schneerson. You go to him and you get the good stuff. So he's on the next flight to New York. And he's expecting to walk into a place where everyone's sitting down, meditating about purpose of creation. And you know, I don't know what's going on, some nice slow music in the background. He walks in and he says he sees a zoo. Now we see that every day. We know exactly what he saw. He saw us. He saw Chassidim. He saw live people. He saw people that have things to do with their life, places to go, people to meet, worlds to change. So therefore... He says, this can't be the place. So he says, you know what? I'm going to stay here at least a few days. Let me hear what the rabbi has to say. The rabbi comes to Fabrengen and he starts speaking Yiddish and he's totally lost. He says, I don't know what's going on in this place. I'm out of here. Before he leaves, someone convinces him that, you know what? You've got to give this a fair chance. Learn some Yiddish, pick it up. Maybe you'll gain something here. So off he goes to Teferes, and the rest is history. He comes back to Vancouver, and he's wearing this hat and jacket. It's probably clean, though. It's probably all the say there. He comes back to Vancouver with his beard and his payas and his hat and his jacket, and his friends tell him, whatever his English name was, we'll call him Tzvi. He says, Tzvi, you're in the cult. Let's not fool ourselves. You are in a cult. You know, I don't know what you're wearing, I don't know what you're preaching, but you are in a cult. So he turns to his friends and he says, I want to tell you why I am not in a cult. He says, what do you mean? He says, the mission of a cult, the leader of the cult is looking for followers. He's looking to take the life out of his followers, 
And he's even looking to take the money out of the parents of the followers. That's like the ultimate goal is you get the money. He says, my Rebbe takes all his students and sends them away. He makes them leaders. Every Sunday he gives out dollars. He doesn't take money. This rabbi is something else. He is totally not in a cult. So they turn to him and they say, Tzvi, fine, you're not in a cult. But why are you dressed so old-fashioned? Like, why don't you get with the times? You know, like ripped jeans and a ripped shirt and some tattoo or something. You know, that's like cool. Why are you wearing this black hat and black jacket that reminds us of our Zayd in the shtetl? So Tzvi is a very smart man. And he says, my dear friends, if your brain is not fried enough, I want you to understand something. And listen closely. He said, you think that I am trying to show you what the world looked like a hundred years ago. I am trying to show you what you're going to look like in a hundred years. In other words, it's not about the past. It's about a focus on the future. Why am I saying this? Because in all honesty, and I like to be honest, I feel totally out of place talking here tonight. Like, no question. Gimel Tammuz, you want to hear from somebody that was there in the Yuds and the Chafs and the Lamids, at least the Mems and the Nuns. Not somebody that knows the Rebbe of the Samachs. You know, this is not the type of Zechroinus that you want to hear from tonight on Gimel Tammuz. So there's nothing that I'm going to tell you that happened in the past, because I wasn't there. I sat right here, you know, kicking whoever was sitting in front of me. That's about it. If you saw, Friedman still doesn't forgive me for kicking him those Fabrengans. You know, this is, this is what I did here all those years ago. Zechreinus, forget about it. Hergeshim, forget about it. And, you know, the, the Sikh is a lead for more learned people. I'm here tonight a little bit to tell you about the future, because I deal with the future every day. I deal with your kids. And that's something you may not want to hear. But if you hang on just a little bit, I'll appreciate something. But before we get to the future, I want to give you a little hope for the present. I want to share with you two stories how what's going on right now in the world of Shlichus, how we see clearly that the Rebbe train out Bavorint. Ohio, which is the state where I live, is known for the three C's, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. That's the three C's. And we all know between us the Melchomis that go on between all those cities, which ain't come to me laharif. In Cincinnati is the great giant Rabbi Kalmanson. And in Columbus, the Heinte Gisliach in Columbus is Rabbi Aryeh Koltman. Recently, Rabbi Aryeh Koltman came to Fabreng for the Bochum in Yeshiva. Now Rabbi Aryeh Koltman, he speaks the Bochum's language from Australia. You know, he's with the program. The Bochum think he's cool. You know, he's... He's really one of, a, one of us. He's really, really a younger man, a Siddish younger man. But, you know, without all the fanfare, he speaks it the way it is. So he was fabrenging. And, of course, he gave the Bochrim an introduction about a Bochrim's life, a Shlichis. And then he went on to the most important part of Shlichis today, which is called fundraising. And... He was telling them a moridika maisa of the Rebbe, how the Rebbe helped him in advance 50 years ago. Names will not be disclosed in order to con continue to make sure that his people still give him shlucham are very protective about the Balabatim. You will not hear the names tonight. You will just hear people. He had a Balabas that used to give him 90 grand a year, and his name is not Schottenstein. Besides, that gave him ninety thousand dollars a year. This Balabas was getting old, and he realized very quickly that this guy's children had different hasogas of how to spend their father's will, and it wasn't going to Rabbi Shatten, to Rabbi Coltman. 
The 90 grand was quickly going to be cut to like 15 or 20. That left him a $70,000 bill or hole in his budget. Now, $70,000 for some may seem like a small sum. For some of us, $70,000 is a lot of money. And to start raising an additional $70,000, one day he gets a call that sure enough, this big veer is in the hospital on his deathbed. And the person passes away. And now we talk and knows that the $70,000 Bill just began. The, the game just began. He comes home and he's a little bit depressed. First of all, the guy just passed away. That's depressing. $70,000 passed away. That's also depressing. So between the two of them, he's extremely depressed. He gets a call from his secretary. And he says, Arye, we just got a check for $10,000. Okay, that's nice. What's this check for and who's it from? There's a funny lady. She lives out there in California. She said that she was in her child's home, some hick town in California, and she had learned, this child had learned in Ohio State University. So therefore, she had the calendar of Rabbi Kaltman. So he decided that they're going to send him a $10,000 check in honor of the calendar. Okay, 60. We're doing good. This is right before pay, this is right before Hanukkah. So he decided, you know what? Ten thousand dollar donation. The lady at least deserves a menorah, right? Four dollars, ten thousand dollars. He sends her a menorah. Sure enough, a week later, ten grand in honor of the menorah. Now this works. <laughs> comes along, comes along, put him, sends her shalach monis, ten grand. We're going. 30. Pesach, two matzes, 10 grand. Like Boimer, bow and arrow, 10 grand. Shmu is some cheesecake, and 10 grand keeps on coming. And he's like, I don't want to stop this. I don't know what's going on, but something's going on over here. You know, he's thinking of new ways and books, maybe flowers. He doesn't know what's the next hit. But 10 grand. After a while, he tells himself, either he's dreaming. Or something is crazy. You've got to talk to this lady. If she's crazy enough, maybe she's crazier. Maybe she has bigger asagas. So on the check, there's a number. He gives this lady a call. He tells her, I'm flying down to California next week. We've got to meet. This is something we've got to do. Walks into her house. She's sitting there. She's a lady in her 70s. 60s, I don't know. I'll make it up. Let's make her 65. And therefore, she's sitting there in her house, and Rabbi Coltman walks in, and he says, I don't want to stop good things. Maybe give me a little bit of an insight to what's going on. I've been on the road long enough to know that this doesn't happen every day. People don't just throw out ten grand like this one after another. It's like, you know me, you never met me, you don't know who I am. Why are you giving me so much money? Don't stop, but, you know. Let's see how we can make this go better. So she tells him, Rabbi Coltman, you think I'm giving you the money? <laughs> I'm giving the money to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He says, okay, that works for me. What's going on? He says, I want to tell you like this. My family roots are in Munkach. You're Munkach and And then, during the war we came over to America. In the 1950s, my sister, she got sick. My sister, she wasn't feeling well. My father, who wasn't so from at the time, but being that he had Chassidisha roots, so he knew that a Rebbe Dabr Shoen Gefinin. He has to find a Rebbe. You know, you know when somebody's sick, they have gained to a Rebbe. Saving on Zuchin for a Rebbe, we're looking for a Rebbe. So like Rabbi Zilberstein said yesterday, no Rebbe wanted it except this not from family to speak to them. But she heard that there's this young, pretty cool looking Rebbe living in Crown Heights, and he's more open-minded, and maybe he's ready to accept them. They call up the Maskiris, 
And the Rebbe says, no problem, an appointment, we're in. They come in, and they ask the Rebbe for a bracha for a sister, and the Rebbe gives a bracha, and the sister gets better. Now, like most good people, we don't, know, we don't say thank you, we just say please. They forgot to say thank you to the Rebbe. She said that the, the incident fell out of her mind. Until she came to her daughter's home, and she's looking through the calendar at, at the wall. Now, it must have been in the calendar there were pictures of the Rebbe throughout the years. Older, younger. She sees a picture of the Rebbe from the youths. And he says, I know this man. I owe him a favor. I owe him something. So she says, where can I thank him? So the young student says, you can thank him by helping his emissary. So he said, I saw your address and you are my thank you to the Rebbe. And every year it's $80,000. That's one story. I want to share with you another story. The story happened with Rabbi Moshe Wilhelm, Shliach of the Rebbe to Portland, Oregon. I spent a bunch of summers out there in Portland, in the Green State, as it's called. And I was witness to, to some amazing things. The following story I was not witness to, but I was witness to the person that it happened with. Rabbi Wilhelm was learning in Koilul in Melbourne. And at that point we know that Rabbi Groner, he had a big plan of building the Melbourne Kehila. And the plan was like this. You go to Tanyun Galait, you tell them to come to Melbourne for two years, and the Rebbe doesn't let them come back. Now that's a way to build the Kehila. Now you tell them it's two years and it's forever. So the first group, they were a little naive. Two years, a better salary, shlichis, maises, blah, blah, blah. Oh, maises! They're going to Melbourne. The two years are finishing, and mid the mold, the Rebbe is not letting anyone leave. One after another, they're stuck in Melbourne. He was offered a shlichis in Portland, and he wrote to the Rebbe, and sure enough, he was shocked that the Rebbe was masking to his shlichus. Now, one of the yesoidists of his shlichus was that some of the Merkish shluchim found there like three balabatim that promised to support him. So listen, he has the support, Rebbe is a good, Bamir good. He packs his stuff on a boat, shows up to Portland. He gets two welcomes. The first welcome was a notice that the boat is lost. It's not coming to Portland. So all this stuff is somewhere on the sea. So that's what you have is lost. So at least he's counting on what he's going to have. In the airport, one of the three Balabata meet him and they tell him, I was just joking. <laughs> I didn't really mean this. What are you doing here? This was a joke. You know, you didn't take this as a joke. Joke or no joke, he's here. He's stuck in Portland. Hefter on a Maisa, starting like every Shliach. He's trying to set, set up shop. He's building a Menorah. There's Machlekes with Reform, a whole story. Then he starts, like every Shliach, he wants to build a day school. Now, anyone that has any experience with day schools, day schools are synonymous with zoning problems. That's like the synonymous of day school, the zoning issues. Because you do it in a house, it's not a house, it's not meant for a school, it is a school, you have rules, regulations. Zoning, vetnam is sugar. So right away when he opens, either somebody master on him, you have to ask him the details, the kids at Africa get thin in a lawyer. Now, an alternatic, now he's a guy, that he's a real alternative. When he would learn to know the Torah, so his father wanted him to learn English. And the Rebbe told his father, Mashiach kum, for was not for learning English. So English he didn't learn. So therefore, he's a real Alatarinik. He's married to a right chick, you know, straight from heaven. And therefore, they land in Portland. Go find a lawyer. So what does he do? 
He asks one of the people, who's a good lawyer? Opens up a phone book. Find Gefinter, the top lawyer. Everybody tells him that this lawyer is not going to talk to you. And he says, Mach nishtois. picks up the phone, he's looking for Mr. So-and-so, he needs a lawyer. To his, Someone doesn't want me to talk. To his utter shock. Emotion. To his utter shock, the guy calls back and he tells him, I'm ready to help you with whatever you need. No problem, I'll take you up. He comes and he, he fights his case and he takes care of him. And he tells him why, not after the case, not before, after. Why would you help me? So I'll tell you very pushing. I grew up living on Sterling Street. That's where I lived, by the park over there. I lived on Sterling Street. My father was once sick, and he was very sick. And our neighbors told him, Du suchst doctors, da in Crown Heights, gefind sich a Rebbe, was macht Mofsen? Go to the Rebbe. He goes to the Rebbe. And they get a bracha. And the father's machla goes away and he lives many years. On the father's deathbed, the father tells his son, we owe a favor to Chabad. Fine. But this son had moved off to Oregon and he never thought about the word Chabad again. There's no Chabad of Oregon. He says, I get a message on my machine. It's Rabbi Willam from Chabad. I need your help. And he says, that moment he remembered that he has an old chayv to pay. And Ada Yoim, he's the lawyer for the Beis Chabad. This is all, Hayroiz, this shows us how the Rebbe is taking care of his shluchim, the Rebbe is taking care of his people today. However, there is one group of people that we have to take care of. The Rebbe nem care from Yanim. Never takes care of his luchim. We have to take care of our kids. And I want to I wanna say something. I know many people don't like to hear it, and I don't care. I'm not getting paid. So therefore, I can say what I want. And I don't care if they don't invite me back. Listen. Mekin zogin chai vikayon mitegan sesturim with the Gantz and Nigen, with the Gantz and Simon and the Ramos and the Golem, whatever you want, and it's all good. Instead of fighting over someone that's for sure Chai Vikayam, it's time we focus on a group of people that it's a very big suffix if they are Chai Vikayam. And that is our own little kids. I want you to hear something. I'm telling it to you because you are much older than me and I'm younger than you and I deal with your kids every day, all day, 12 months a year and, you know, I see it. Gimel Tammuz didn't change a thing. He's a nigga na yidua. The Rebbe Davin to Nelen. All to good. Fabrengen. It's all good. There is one Shinoi that we cannot close our eyes to, and that is that we are not yet ready to change the way we taught our kids 20 years ago and the way we are teaching them today. And I want to explain what I mean because I don't like to say Helika Verge, that will leave the Helika people. I'm going to be very explicit about what I mean. Growing up, in yeshiva 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, this was the Hanukkah. The Hanukkah is, and was, we will do our part, we'll keep the kids in a system, but the Rebbe's Dug Mechaya will keep the kids forever. Zolzei Valgren in 770, and the Rebbe even encouraged us with in 770. Let them hang out by dollars, by yechidis, I spent in Tavshim and Ches, my brother's al Gazunzite, so she was one of the w- women, she's listening to me now too, so this is for Bobby. She
she would slap the ladies by dollars. So every single dollar she would slap me to the Rebbe's house. So I spent hours in the Rebbe's kitchen in Tav Shemem Ches. So vi mach vi, something got in a little bit. So whether we learned in yeshiva, the teachers cared or they didn't care, they put into us, they didn't put into us. Our dug mechaya was not the teacher. Our dug mechaya is and was the Rebbe. We knew that our teachers could be not so perfect. They can be who they are, and they still are, Baruch Hashem, not perfect. But we have somebody that's very perfect. And this perfect person is the Rebbe. And I see him, I daven with him, I come to his Fabrengen every week, and I know exactly where to find him. He's sitting right there in 770 Eastern Parkway. I want to fast track 20 years. Today, we still don't care about the kids. Today, we're still relying on the kinders of Valgadin. Do you want to know where they're Valgadin? It's not in 770 anymore. They're all over the place. They're all over the place. And the way we deal with the kids is we're not ready to put in any more effort. So they came up with a new Hamza. And the Amsa is that we're going to rely on the Rabbanim. And guess what happens every time in Yeshiva I mention the word Rabbanim, they think it's a milsa de Bdichasa. Which Rav, when Rav, you'll get one sack from one, I'll get another one from the other. Rabbi Hamsa, why are you going to say, I have a Rav that will tell me if I cared? The Rabbanim, forget about it. Non-issues. They are not with the program because we killed ourselves. So we, the Rebbe, we can't see. The Rabbanim of Mengahargit. Guess who we're left with ourselves? We're back to ourselves. So now we cannot pass the hot potato to anyone else. It's time that we take a cheshben anefesh. And let me tell you, I'm going to share with you a few conversations, real conversations that happen. It's time that we shape up. I'm speaking with a certain bacher, and I notice, and I notice, that when it comes to tefillah b'tzibur, he pasha doesn't get it. I give him a punishment, I give him a reward, I give him a slap, not a slap, but he pasha zelonich naset slow, he doesn't get it. So after a while I sit down and I say, why don't you dive him with a minion? He says, why tefillah b'tzibur is not important? My father doesn't dab him with a minion. Now, what are you supposed to answer a 15-year-old kid? You're supposed to tell him your father is wrong. At least one person he should respect in his life. You can tell him he's right. It's also wrong. So you have this kid growing up. He pushes, doesn't know, dab me with a minion. I have a friend of mine. He shares with me a conversation he had with a kid. He was going through Seder Ayoyim. And he tells him, see, this is 7.30 and Shachris is 8.30. A kid raises his hand. He says, by my house, Shachris is 7.30 p.m. The kids, what do you expect from them? Their parents are blown. The parents are not ready to show them what it is. And then they want their kids. And it's the Mechadchim's fault. It's question my fault. It's everyone else's fault by your own fault. You bring a television into your house and you wonder why your kids are blown. You bring the internet into your house and you wonder why my kids picked up Avoy the Zorah. Plus it's the Mechanech's fault. He picked it up in Yeshiva, right? In your dining room, it's Faran. You tell a kid, he's supposed to learn Gemara. He says, my father hasn't opened his chasen shas yet. What are you supposed to tell these kids? He's supposed to tell them, well, the chasen shas was brought for decorations. And he says he has another fancy smart and sets the rest of the place. What are you supposed to tell the kids? I need help here. Let me tell you something. It's about time that everyone here and everyone around this world had better step up and take care of their kids. Because they are very suffic if it's chai v'kayim. The sikhs are all about the nasi adur. About your kids, I don't know. You have to push it, take yourself, and decide, I am ready to be makriv, my nefesh instead of being makriv, my kids. You have a 
a choice. There are two things on the Mizbeach right now. There's your tithes, there's your money, there's your business, and there's your time on one Mizbeach. And you have your kids, and their future, and your eneklach, and doiri doiris of sidim on another Mizbeach. You have a choice. You can come home and take the time and learn with your kids' homework, or you can take the time and listen to the sports game, or listen to the news, or push it relax after a long day. Well, then guess where your kids are. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? They're not doing the homework themselves. So they don't do homework. So they're behind in school. Let me tell you something. There's no such a thing as a kid that can't be matzliach. There is such a thing as a child that doesn't have the tools to be matzliach. If a parent would learn with his kids every single day, or three, four times a week, go over, at least show that you're interested in what he's doing. Imagine there's a kid suffering all day in yeshiva, and his father doesn't even ask him, what have you learned today? Forget about Faharim. He has no, if dad has no interest in me, why am I interested? So the kid falls behind. He's in seventh grade. He can't come read Zibra. He doesn't know how to teach. He doesn't get accepted into yeshiva. He's stuck here in town with his 150 kids yeshivas. He falls behind again. He's looking for friends. There's a nightlife out there. I'll just, you know, to Crown Heights is colorful. We know that. You know, it's all open. It's all out in the open. You know, I'll tell you a story, and I'm very chutzpah sometimes. I, it just gets to me sometimes. I'm walking up Brooklyn Avenue, and I see this girl flip-flopping around with this. And I tell her, excuse me, hello, you, yeah? I see you can't afford socks. Here's five dollars. No, we're in a world, you think we're living somewhere in Hollywood. We're living here in Crown Heights. This is the Ebishkuna. Instead of the kids running to Crown Heights, I have parents running to send their kids from Crown Heights. This is wrong. This is mad. But this is what's going on. I've been my kids only dying in Crown Heights. Who would have thought that this is the Sprach today? I've been my kids only dying. Instead of training a bunker that the gold, the sepia, the yearning of every chassid is to be here, everyone's running away. So what happens? So what happens? So people, we're not interested. We're not ready to work. From ourselves, we're not ready to give up. So we'll pay extra schalim, we'll hire a tutor, we'll hire a baba and a zayda. It doesn't help. There is no substitute for real, for MS. And for a child, believe it or not, you are his emiss. You're a parent, you brought this kid into the world, you are his emiss. There is no other way to deal with it. I'm sorry to speak like this, Gimel Tamus, Tashun Samaches. Because I don't, I just don't know. I got one chance at this, and this is it. You push it, have to step up, and be koiveya itim la a child gets up, he knows, his father goes to the mikveh. Today with the mikveh on Kingston, it's not mysterious nefesh anymore. He gets up and he gets to the mikveh. He knows his father learns 20 minutes to see this. His father davens with a minion. His father cares about his homework and has a shear and gemara twice, three times a week. And then we have a chance that ulay, 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 yada labruach mimorim, and our kids will be the seder. Because... We are not perfect, and it's very hard to raise children. Siyata Deshmaya is something that medavin, we're when we go to the Rebbe, we daven for Siyata Deshmaya for our children. This is what it is. Because we can be perfect and we still don't know what's going to happen. But, but, if we're not ready to be at least a chalik of the Dug Mechaya, so the Siyata Deshmaya has no keli to land in. The Avis Dervil help him. David said, the Rebbe loves the children. He loves his Bachar, and he benches them every, every, every Arab Yom Kippur. He takes from his time before Kol Nidre, puts his talis over his head. He traps himself in his kittel. He cries and he benches his Bachar. He loves his kids. Do you love his kids? And therefore, when it comes today, we push it at the wake up and wake up and decide that we are joining the program. We're not telling everyone that's it, change your life. The TV's out of the home. The beard's on the face, not behind your hair. You know, today's people 
beards are growing backwards. The beards have to be here, not here. How do you expect people to raise kids, you raise your mayim, when they look at you and they think you're poshit, the misnagi they read about in the Rishiva somewhere. The beard's on the face, the TV's out of the homes, the internet out of the homes, the newspaper's out of the homes. I know it's hard, Mr. Snevis, because magazines, out of the homes. You'll save it for when you're going on Mephsoyim and you're waiting in the office and you found the newspaper. So Dorothy Megman later. But in the home, Mitarnit Alayim bringing in stool. It's Poshit Lebedikabombis. Poshit Lebedikabombis. Now, there was once a rabbi. And this rabbi was struggling for a minion. Week after week after week, he didn't have a minion. One week he decided that, you know what, you know what, I'm putting all my koiches in and I'm getting a minion. Sure enough, they're arbit on arbit on arbit. And you know in bowling there's that one pin that doesn't fall? That one yid didn't show up that day and therefore he's left with nine people. Hey, they're on Shrayin. How are you talking? There's no minion in the city screaming and yelling. So the people, one of the Balabatim, raises his hand and they say, Rabbi, you're screaming at the wrong crowd. We are here. The ones that you're supposed to scream about are outside. I want to tell you something. This is off the record. I look around this crowd. I have a lot of nachas. I'm going to say to advice of Berder. I'm going to say to Berder. Where is that whole crowd of Jungalait today? Now, I know many of you are living in a fantasy world that all Jungalait today are going on Shlicha somewhere. They're not here in Crown Heights. So let me tell you something. Reality. About 30% of people go on Shlicha. 40. If they have a Shver, a father, a Zayd, a Baba somewhere. And if they can afford the $100,000 needed to go on and shlich in your bank account before, because if not, who's going to support you? Because the Eivishter somehow got loose some funds. He can't support any more shluchim, so you have to fundraise three years in advance, whatever. So you have tens and tens of young light that Poshit live here in Crown Heights. You know... That in Tanakh there's small Aleph, small base, Heinz in Crown Heights, the base small Aleph, and a base small base, and a base small Gimel and Dalit. There is a shul for every age. Now I know many of you think that there are like 10 people in those shuls. So let me tell you. There's 150 here, and 150 there, and 100 over here. There's hundreds of Jungalites. Hundreds of Jungalites. We're not talking about those that religiously won't come. You know, that's a whole different breed. We're talking about people that are ready to come. They want to come. They grew up right here. But they're just totally disenchanted, my friends. They're just blown away by this place. This is way too heavy for them. They, are, they just want a place where they can daven. They want a place where they can be with their friends. They want a place where they can be a mensch. And... I know it's easy to say, well, it's a schus to be in 7 Sam. They don't want to get the schus. It's their problem. That's a, good, that's a good attitude. So five years from now, we'll have less people. Just keep it up. That's like very good going. Let's keep it up. This is terrible, my friends. We have to get into our heads that there's a whole crowd of people out there that want to come to 770, that love to be in 770, that learned the sikh of Kuntus the Beis Abenu Shebebavel. And they know that right here is Beis Mashiach. They know that right here is Maka Mikdash Delazid is right here. But they just feel that they can't come here. Now, point today, I, I saw a Ksaviyad of the Rebbe. The Rebbe writes, Ani Eini Misarev Begabos. I'm not telling anyone how to run the shul here. You know, this is not my job. If they have a misuch nishuch, misuch nishuch. But one thing I want to tell you. It's not even the job of the gaboyim. We all have to think to ourselves 
The same way, it's the biggest slichus. We feel so proud to bring a Makurav here to 770. I know I have about 50 minutes because it's me 200 people with soccer uniforms dancing right here in a few minutes. They're on the way. You know, I don't know what they're singing, but they're coming. So therefore, the speech is very brief right here. Get ready. And therefore, and we are so excited, 200 guests are coming to 770. Let me tell you, there are 2,000 Anas in Crown Heights that are ready to come to 770. 2,000 Anash in Crown Heights that are ready to come to 770. We have, we're in the zoo, and we have to be the welcoming committee. We can't have the attitude of Rosh Bakir. We're here, I don't care. I want to ask somebody, do you know that you're throwing people out of 770? Do you know what you're doing is wild off the wall? You know, in the world, they think Gershon Afton's off the wall. I like coming here. I see I'm normal. <laughs> you know, let me tell you something. So the guy tells me, listen up. The Rebbe said at Darfno have an ain't state, dry, and that's it. What? The Rebbe said he only needs three action and everyone else can be out of 770. I said, good going. This is off the wall. We have to re-franchise ourselves. We have a Rebbe the Rebbe. We have the Rebbe. We have Chesidus. We have everything. All we need to do is hit the road. They say I'm Maisa and I'm going to be Messiah. I see everyone is staring at I'm getting these stares. I'm uncomfortable up here. Let me tell you a story about a conversation that happened between a little camel and a big camel. One day, the little camel turns to his mom and he says, Ma, I'm getting the feeling that I'm strange. He says, Why? Because I have humps in my back, and no one else has humps in their back. So they tell him, no, my dear son, you're not strange. You're special. We are special. The camels are special. No behemoth can go through the hot desert. Only the camel. And therefore, we need to have special humps on our back to go through the desert. Excellent. Two days later, he turns to his mother, and he says, Ma, we're weird. We have funny feet. He says, we're not weird. We're special. We go on the hot sand, and we need funny feet. A few days later, he says, Ma, I feel like a girl. I have long eyelashes. So he says, no, you're going to go in the desert, and there's a lot of sand flowing in the air, and you need to block out the sand. So he says, Ma, I don't understand. I have humps because I'm supposed to be in the desert. I have feet because I'm supposed to be in the desert. I have eyelashes because I'm supposed to be in the desert. What are we doing in the Bronx Zoo? Hermit cup. Hermit cup, Hebra, I'm going to be Messiah. We have a Rebbe because we're Chesidim unbelievable. We have Chesidim and we're unbelievable. We have Chesidim and we're unbelievable. We have this Mashiach. Our Rebbe is Mashiach. Can you imagine that? Which Chesidim can say that their Rebbe is Mashiach? Nobody. They don't even think of saying that. See, I want to, I want to, uh, say Chosidim. He says, um, why do you guys believe, believe your Rebbe is Mashiach? So I said, why don't you believe? Well, I can't do my Rebbe. <laughs> you know what I mean? These guys are off the wall. They know it too. I was, in, I was on Slichas in Yeshiva in Toronto, and right next door to us were some Nesnag de Shabokhim smoking in our backyard. And one of them was a Buyana Chosid. The Mechus Koyter also of the Buyana. So I asked him, Does your Rebbe let you smoke? So he says, No. So why are you smoking? You know, he doesn't know what's going on over here. So they know who their Rebbe is, and they're not ready to even entertain the thought. Och in the of that's Mashiach. And we have a group of Siddim, and we're proudly bannering away that our Rebbe is Mashiach, and he is. That's the good part. And therefore, and therefore, instead of taking all this, and I don't know, let's stay, we're staying in the Bronx Zoo. We're like locked in our little machlaikis. We're busy wondering, they're cooked up You know, like a zoo. They're cooked, they're cooked. We're fighting with each other, making shows for the whole world. Gantzavelt kum. Then, what's the picture and the cameras and the spiel and the 
jokes. It is Lebedic over here. We are in the Bronx Zoo. What are we doing? It's about time we pick ourselves up and we get, and get, get on the road. We're supposed to hit the desert. The desert is the place where it's rough and tough. And only a Lubavitcher Chosid can go there. There's a letter of the Friedrich Rebbe to Menachem Zemba, who was a tremendous tzaddik. When the Friedrich Rebbe came to Europe, and not to Europe, to Poland, he wanted to make a Chassidish Akoilo. And Menachem Zemba was supposed to be the Rosh Yeshiva. And he said, I want them to learn Chassidish and only Chassidish Chabad. And Menachem Zemba said he wants them to learn Polish Chassidish. And there's a strong Michtav, and it's recommended reading for everyone. The Friedrich Rebbe said, I don't want to embarrass you. I'm not telling you them to learn Chassidus Chabad, because without it, they won't be Matzliach. Without it, they can't be Matzliach. He says, my Chassidim are in Russia being shot. My Chassidim are in Russia being killed. My Chassidim are in Russia being sent to Siberia. Not that you guys wouldn't do it. You guys can't do it. You don't have Chassidus Chabad. It's not that you wouldn't, you push it can't. Without Siddhis Chabad, me push it can't. And therefore, we have to pick up the best ammunition that we have. And that is Siddhis Chabad. We scream and yell, how come Yana Dum is coming to Ashir Tanya? If I would make Ashir Tanya tonight, who would come? Don't raise your hands at once. No one's coming. But Yana learned this Siddhis in the grace of Avla. Everyone here in this room, has to have a sheer kavu and limit achsidus. It's not voluntary. Without it, you cannot survive. You cannot survive this matzib without a sheer kavu and chsidus, without a sheer kavu and the Rebbe Sichis, before the Sichis Achreines. It's not that you won't survive. You push it, can't survive. So therefore, tonight, Gimel Tamus Tashin Samaches. It's not going to be the beginning of the Rebbe's Gula. He's already way ahead. It's going to be the beginning of our Gula. The Rebbe said, the goal is Pnimi and Avaidus Hashem. It's Aschal to the Gula, Chevra. The way that we're going to express this tonight is by Kvin Kaveya, Ashir Chsidis, Livnei Atfila. But this Tfila is going to start before Zman Tfila, or at 10 o'clock the latest. Not Shir Chsidis, Livnei Atfila at 9 o'clock at night. Or that everyone knows we can come in 770, 5 o'clock, there's a mini chakras. That language has to be out. People know you come to 770, it stops at 10. Because Lubavitchers are up, they're employed. They're not these unemployed people that people think we are. Except for Shabbos Mavarach in 1030. That is the message. This is the schaut of our geula. We are going to save ourselves and forget about yourself. You're going to save your kids. The Rebbe Melech HaMashiach, when he's called the Rebbe, and 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 he's called the